Thank you very much. Um, I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I spend most of my uh, public life talking to fellow neuroscientists. So it's always a challenge to talk to an audience whose composition is as diverse as this one. And I guess when I agreed to give this talk, a few hours later, I felt myself suddenly asking myself, well, why did I agree? I felt caught between, I think, action and inaction. Um, now, my talk will have some science associated with it, so I will try to explain that as easily and simply as possible. And I'm going to develop my theme in the context not of this type of situation, which might be a prototypical example of being caught between, as Shakespeare said, the hot passion of distempered blood uh, versus a free determination twixt right and wrong. So this is a famous painting by Inglés, and it shows a man, I assume the husband, coming home, finding his wife doing things she shouldn't be doing. And of course, the hot distempered blood might cause him to take the sword and cleave his head off, but the sort of more rational um, element would suggest just hold fast. Inaction is the most, the optimal strategy here. But what about this type of situation, which is very famous among moral philosophers? And many of you may be familiar with this. There's a train coming to a track. That track has got five people tied to it. And here's the twist. You are here, and you see a lever, and you know that that lever, by moving it, will change the train from this track with the sure death of five people onto this track with the sure death of one person. Would you move that lever to rescue five for the sake of one? And if your answer is yes, well, what about this scenario? So now the scenario is the train is coming. It's going to run over five people. You can stop the train only by throwing something onto the track. There happens to be a fat person on the bridge. Would you push them onto the track to stop the train? And most people would say yes here, and they would say no here. But the outcome is exactly the same. One person dies, five survive. And we would see the person here as more morally culpable should they push the person onto the track than the person who moved the lever, even though the outcome is exactly the same. So action and inaction are much more complicated than we think. But as my jumping off point, I'm going to turn to a piece of literature. And this is a book by Joseph Conrad. And the book is Lord Jim. Uh, many of you may know the book, but there is a famous scene in the book which, when I read it, really found very powerful. And the scene is where Jim, who has signed up to be a, 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 in the Merchant Navy, he's on a ship that's traveling from India to Saudi Arabia. He's taking 500 Muslim pilgrims on the Hajj. They're all down in the hold of the ship. The ship is called the Patna. Most of the crew are European. There are a few Malay people who are working the engine. But for the greater part, the crew is European. And as they cross the Red Sea, the ship, which is very, very old and very rickety, hits something and starts to take on water very fast. And what happens then is that the crew, the captain and other members of the crew, lower the one lifeboat, get on the lifeboat, and decide that they are going to hightail it. And by the way, this is based upon a true happening. And they say they're going to go. Now, Jim, who has been brought up in Britain with all the sort of moral standards of uh, Victorian uh, Britain at the time, feels repelled by this. They're shouting for somebody called George, who is one of their friends, to jump on with them. He realizes that he's caught in a dilemma. If he jumps, there'll be safety. If he doesn't jump, he'll sink with the ship. And if he doesn't sink with the ship, he knows the pilgrims will be pretty angry when they discover 
that all the crew members have abandoned them and he will be offered up to their anger. So I'm just going to read Jim's testimony when it goes to court because the ship didn't sink, in fact, and they live, the pilgrims live to tell the tale. The uh, crew were arrested and tried. So this is Lord Jim giving evidence in front of a hearing. He says there were 800 people in the ship, 800 living people, and they were yelling after the one dead man. This is George, who had actually died. This is the person they were asking to, to jump, to come down and be saved. Jump, George, jump, oh, jump. I was very quiet. It had come over pitch dark. You could see neither sea nor sky. I heard the boat alongside go bump, bump, and not another sound down there for a while. But the ship under me was full of talking noises. Suddenly the skipper howled, mine got, the squall, the squall, shove off. With the first hiss of rain and the first gust of wind, they screamed, jump, George, we'll catch you, jump. The ship began a slow plunge. The rain swept over her like a broken sea. My cap flew off my head. My breath was driven back into my throat. I heard it as if I'd been on top of a tower another wild screech, George, go, jump. She was going down, down, head first under me. I had jumped, he checked himself, it seems, he added. I knew nothing about it till I looked up, he explained hastily. There was no going back. It was as if I jumped into a well, into an everlasting deep hole. So that story has got three elements which I think raise a challenge to inaction. And I'm going to unpack each of those elements. The first one is conformity. This is the conformity, but what is your point of reference? The conformity to the actions of your fellow Europeans or conformity to what would be the most humanist thing to do is to stay at all costs with, with the passengers on the ship. And of course, that has modern echoes in relation to what's happened in the ferry disaster in South Korea and more proximally uh, what happened off the coast of Italy. This framing, how you perceive the problem. So in his mind, he's running through that if he jumps, he'll be on the lifeboat and he can push it off and his life will be saved. He's also having the fantasy that if he stays on board and the pilgrims emerge to discover the crew is abandoned, he will be murdered because they will be so angry. So he's all these fantasies and that framing is also something that influences behavior. And then there's this sort of basic idea of human fairness. And this is very, very complicated. And I will address whether there is evidence for this basic human fairness and how that might impact upon action and inaction. So if we take conformity, a very simple definition of conformity would be a disposition to act in accordance with the majority. More scientifically, it would be the disposition to decrease within group variance and increase between group variance. In other words, you mark yourself off from those around you. Now, conformity is a very, very powerful phenomenon because we see it in everyday life and the way people dress, the way teenagers dress, but we also see it in states where people conform uh, in a very absurd way, such that, for example, if you're clapping here and you don't clap loud enough, that could be the difference between life and death. Now, conformity is adaptive in many respects. It's clearly adaptive in North Korea to your survival. But from an individualist perspective, as Kennedy said, conformity is the jailer of freedom and the enemy of growth. So there's two tensions in conformity. And the two components to conformity, one is the norm, follow the crowd, that's a normative. But there's another aspect to conformity, which is what I would call the informational aspect. Sometimes it is useful to follow the crowd because 10 heads are better than one in judging a situation, particularly if you're uncertain. So conformity as a concept is not monolithic. You can recognize at least two components, 
the normative and the informational. So let me give you an example, a very famous example of conformity and its power. And this is one of probably the two most famous experiments in all of psychology. And this is called the ASH experiment. It was done in the 50s in the USA. And it was done by this man here, Ash. That's why it's called the Ash Experiment. And it involved people coming to a laboratory, a group of people, and they were given a very simple task, which I'm going to show you now. And the task was to look at a standard line and to look at some comparison lines. And the task of the subject was, or each of the subjects, was to match the standard with one of the comparisons. And I know everybody here will agree with me when I say that the standard line matches A. Uh, that's what they did in the experiment. Um, so here's how the experiment went. You had Ash conducting the experiment. You had the other, the subjects of the experiment. But it turned out that only one of the subjects was a real subject. The rest were confederates of Ash. And on certain trials, they would call out that that one matched with C. And you might think, how absurd. Uh, and it turned out that this did have an effect upon the judgment of the subject. This was very, very surprising. It was almost like saying black was white and the subject would then call white. So this is the number of errors people made. So when you do this task on your own, you would never make an error unless you were falling asleep or you just woke up. But otherwise, you will be pretty much 100%. But as the number of opponents or confederates who said something different increased, so your num the number of errors you made increased dramatically, such that people could be induced to make the wrong call 40% of the time. And that effect is an effect of social norms, of the power of having to conform. So that's it in a very simple way, a perceptual decision. So the wise thing today would not uh, to do would not to be to call with the crowd, but here people were calling with the crowd. A more interesting and more dramatic experiment was one I did a number of years ago with colleagues from Israel, and this involved memory, and of course this has very powerful ramifications for jurisprudence, for how you should take and waste testimony of eyewitnesses. So here's how the experiment went. People were shown a video of a happening, and in the happening a child was taken and removed by somebody else, and there was a whole scenario. And then after they, people viewed this video, they were asked questions about it. They were then asked questions about elements of the video. And most people were reported correctly about these elements. On the third day, they were brought back into the lab, and now they were asked again the same questions. So we knew what people's memory was. But every now and again, four confederates would be allowed to give the wrong answer that was different than the answer you gave before. And the question is, would this change how you remembered the event? And the answer is, dramatically, it did. So this is the number of errors. So this is the number of errors you would make without any manipulation on the second day. This is with the manipulation where you sow the evidence of the other subjects. It increased the number of errors dramatically. So you are now making about 60% of errors, where before you were only making about 10%. But there's another twist to the experiment, which is we had subjects come back a few days later, and we said to them on this occasion, by the way, the last day you were in the lab, those people were part of a setup for the experiment. You should not believe them whatsoever. They're evidence is unreliable. And of course, people's memory improved, but it didn't improve completely. There were still a lot of errors, because if it improved fully, they should be back down to the 
number of errors they made without any test. So there was an enduring effect of this. So this breaks out the two elements that I spoke about. One is the conformist element, which caused this dramatic effect. But buried underneath that was also an informational element. Subjects were using other people's views in order to construct a memory. And that's why this did not go back down to the level of this, which is what you would expect on the third day. So conformity is posing a problem here for action and inaction. So the last experiment I want to describe to you on conformity is probably the most famous and most notorious experiment ever conducted. Just out of interest, who has never heard of the Milgram experiment? Has everybody heard of it? Who has not heard of it? Not heard. OK. Um, so I'm not preaching to the convert. So this was a notorious experiment conducted at Yale University in 1963. And it is another example and a more troubling example of conformism. And it's troubling for a number of reasons. One is that it seemed to point to human nature being very malleable and having less than uh, benevolent motivations. So Milgram was a psychologist, and he invited subjects to perform an experiment. And the challenge of this experiment is it seems to go against this important moral imperative, that you should not inflict suffering on a helpless person who is neither harmful nor threatening to yourself. So what he did is he placed an advertisement in a local newspaper and around the campus asking people of this type of profession uh, or, or calling, a businessman, clerk, professional people, salespeople, laborers, barbers, etc., would they like to volunteer for a memory test? And the guise of the memory test is that they were testing the effect of punishment on how well people learn. The guise was also that we didn't know this, and the experiment was going to help us try to understand it. And the experiment had the following structure. There were three people. There was the teacher, that is the person who would be doing the, who was the person of interest. There was the experimental subject, and then there was the conduct, the, the laboratory chief. He was always dressed in a gray coat. The subject of the experiment, who was going to be tested, uh, was a genial middle-aged Irish man, and this was the other people who were called in. Now, it seemed, when you turned up at the laboratory, that there were two people there, the teacher and the experimental subject. And it looked like it was random who would become who. In fact, it was a setup like all the other experiments. This person was a collaborator of the, uh, of, of the lab chief. This, the teacher, was the object of the experiment. And so what happened next was the person was strapped into a chair. It was an electrode placed upon their wrist to deliver an electric shock. They were now told that, one, that the way we were going to determine whether punishment improved memory was by delivering electric shocks. And those electric shocks would be delivered by this machine here in increments of 15 volts all the way up to way off the scale, 450 volts. And the teacher, who was the person who was the object of interest, was told that if the subject in the lab got it wrong, they were to increase it by 15 volt increments every time. So this is the, this is the person who was the stooge, who was appearing to be getting electric shocks. This was the object of interest, the teacher. And this was the head of the, the lab. Now, sometimes people objected a little bit. So they would turn to the head of the lab, and he would give them a series of what are called prods. He would just say something like, please continue, or please go on. He would say, the experimenter requires that you continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice. You must go on, even in a situation where the experimental subject was beginning to scream. Now, they weren't really in pain, but if you were the teacher, you thought they were in pain. 
And most of us would imagine that this would lead to inaction. That was the wise thing to do. But in fact, the very troubling aspect of this experiment was the following, is that up to 65 people would push the dials up to the maximum. So the person was screaming inside, and that was a very, very troubling thing. And this is just other examples of experiments where they removed it from the context of the laboratory out into different situations. And of course, context did matter. So if it was imbued, the context was imbued with the notion of respectability, authority, people went the whole hog, as they say. So this experiment was deeply, deeply troubling. Now, you could argue that what has happened is that the teacher you know, has lost all sense of morality. But another argument, you could say that his morality now has an entirely different focus. And this goes back a little bit to the Lord Jim tale. So instead of reacting in a moral way to the outcomes of the actions, in other words, the person being shocked to extreme pain, a consequence of his motivation, his moral concerns shift to a consideration of whether he's giving, living up to the expectation that those in authority have of him, a purely conformist motivation. And this isn't just a argument that, that you can make up to explain this experiment, because it seems to be an argument that is used by people who have committed what one would consider deeply immoral acts from one perspective. So let's take the person who dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. He died only about five years ago. But when he was interviewed on many, many occasions and said, well, did you ever feel bad about that? He said he never lost a night's sleep about it. He felt he was doing his duty. This is what needed to be done. So he was living up to the expectations of those in authority. Equally, many of you will remember that a Korean airline was shot down after it strayed over Soviet territory in the 1980s and shot down by a Soviet pilot. That Soviet pilot, I watched an interview on YouTube, was also asked the question, did you ever lose any night's sleep over that? He said, not at all. He said he was doing his duty and he felt he did it well. And this is a common, common um, narrative of people who have done acts which from one perspective might be seen as deeply immoral, they just explain it in terms of the shift of their moral focus. You might think these type of experiments have gone the way of a lot of experiments in psychology, but in fact they've changed their focus. A lot of them happen on what you call um, sort of live TV, or I, I don't watch TV, so I find it hard to remember the term, but apparently friends of mine have told me this type of experiment has been replicated on TV, so it must be true. So the next theme is framing. Now, framing can be just roughly described in the following terms. It's how the valence, whether an outcome results in reward, pain, good or bad, influences or biases action or inaction. And this is a very, very powerful effect, which I think I can illustrate by engaging you all in the experiment. But don't worry, none of you are going to be shocked. Only your pride is at stake. Um, so, let's supposing I give you a choice. I've given you 50 euro. You can keep 20 of those euro, or you can take a gamble. And if the gamble, if the spinning wheel falls in the green section, you get all the money. You go home with 50 euro, because in the red you go home with nothing. So that is the gamble. And let me ask, how many of you would go for the 20 dollars, 20 euros? Oh, there must be a lot of economists here. Uh, how many of you would go for the gamble? Mm, interesting. Okay. So just bear that in mind. I'm going to give you another gamble. You've still got your 50 euros, but I've changed it a little bit. I'll say you lose 30 euro, or you can have that gamble. Who'd go for the gamble? And who, who'd go for the, the sure loss of 30? <laughs> 
Okay. Now, of course, they're exactly equivalent. All I've done is I've changed the frame on that. Keeping 20 is the same as losing 30 of your original endowment. And of course, that gamble is in terms of a mathematical expected value, the same value as that, because the probability, you have, if, if you iterate this gamble, you should be indifferent between the two. It's got the same expected outcome. And in fact, this is the classic um, behavior that we see in subjects, that when I present that gamble, the uh, that option, the proportion of people who are willing to take the gamble is less than when I present it in the loss frame. So presenting something in a keep versus a loss frame, even though they're actually totally equivalent, changes the disposition to go for the gamble or the safe option. So this is the equivalent thing. So you can see why, for example, people will quibble greatly over wording of referenda um, and hence how dangerous it was to let Alex Salmond chase the word. Uh, anyway, I shouldn't be political. Um, so here's another example of this. So this is, again, not just a laboratory phenomenon. So imagine you're a leader of a country. You're preparing for, this is very timely, for the outbreak of a highly infectious viral disease, which is expected to kill 6,000 people. Two alternative programs to combat the disease have been proposed. Assume the exact scientific estimate of the consequences of the problem are as follows. So you're presented with a choice between two programs, program A and program B. So in a group of 6,000 people, 2,000 people, if you implement program A, will be saved. Program B, there's a one-third probability that 6,000 people will be saved and two-thirds probability that no one will be saved. Okay? So you're the the Minister of Health in the country, and you've got to make that decision. So let's hope you are a sophisticated thinker. Take another scenario. You're presented with the following choice. In a group of 6,000 people, Program C, 4,000 people will die. Program D, there's a one-third probability that nobody will die, and two-third probability that 6,000 people will die. So this is a scenario that Daniel uh, Kahneman, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2002, I think, gave to a bunch of very sophisticated people, doctors. And this is what he found. For this first one, 72% preferred program A, and only 28% opted for program B. The second group, 78% preferred program D, and 22%. Now, those of you who are observant will know that programs A and C are identical, as are programs B and D. So what we've got here is a preference reversal. So people's choices that they thought they were making after deep thinking, great compassion, was actually very irrational because you get a complete reversal of preferences. And it's not a trivial one. This can be shown over and over again. So this provides a problem for inaction because how the outcome or the consequences are framed and whether they are good or bad greatly influences the liability or your disposition towards action or inaction. So let me explain why that is. And I would suggest that actually this reflects something that is below the level of our consciousness, that is a hardwired disposition that's built into our evolutionary past. And this is an experiment conducted on a group of very clever people at UCL. And they're just asked to make very simple choices. They're told that whenever you see yellow, you make a go action. You just move a lever forward and you get a reward. If you see this to get the reward, you don't go. You do nothing. So action, inaction. The outcome is the same for the two. So it should be just very trivial. Every time I see that, I don't do anything. And likewise, we did it in the loss domain. Every time you see this color, you've got to learn to go. And every time this color, you've got to learn not to go. 
So subjects were instructed in the way I've told you, but I just, to make it clear what the experiment's about. So the experiment is like this. They're presented with these type of shapes and they have to learn the action to get a reward or the inaction to get a reward, to learn the action to avoid a punishment or the inaction. So it has the four components, but this, I don't want to make it too complicated. So let's just look at how people learn to go to get the reward. After a few goes, they've actually learned. They're almost performing at 100%. Okay? So action to get a reward is very, very easy. But now let's suppose they have to do a no-go to get the reward. They're absolutely hopeless. So if they're performing perfectly like that, that should be the mirror image of that, and it's not. So it should come down like that. They're absolutely hopeless. And if we ask them to perform a no-go to avoid a punishment, they learn it very, very well, like that. But if we have to ask them to perform go to avoid a punishment, they're absolutely hopeless. So our disposition towards action and inaction is biased depending upon the valence of the outcome. And we can, this is, all of these histograms should be the same height. The two that are really difficult is no go to win and go to avoid losing. And to cut a long story short, we can model this using computational modeling. And the key element of the model that will capture the behaviors that Chubzik show is when we put in this element here, which we call a, bi a Pavlovian bias. And this is predicated on the idea that through our evolutionary heritage, we have an inherited and inherent bias that when things are negative, it biases to inaction, and when things are positive, it biases towards action. And when those come in conflict, we have trouble. And this can explain the framing effect that I showed you in gambling perfectly well. It also explains the framing effect that Kahneman showed. He did not have an explanation for it, but this provides a biologically rooted um, explanation. If we go back to Lord Jim, he was caught between the attraction of going the, and the reward of safety versus the inaction associated with him thinking in his mind of what might happen to him if he stayed on the ship. It was both duty, but it was also terror. And of course, you can show this, the uh, very clever experiments done all the way down to marsupials, which show that this bias is conserved across phylogeny. So the last bit of my talk, I'm going to deal with a fairness motivation, which renders it sometimes difficult for inaction. And I got to talk about it in the context of two very recent experiments, one of which is actually published today in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and one which is under review. So they're very new experiments, uh, and they go back a little bit to Milgram. Because what we wanted to do in these experiments was introduce a commodity that is consumable, not an abstract mind game, and a commodity that's consumable within a laboratory, money is no good. Pain, you can give people mildly painful electric shocks with ethical approval, because subjects, uh, but pain is consumable, it's not postponed, you have it there. That's why it provides a very powerful medium. Now, these, the experiment speaks to this, a uh, very famous person, a very famous book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, because Adam Smith said, for one man unjustly to promote his own advantage by the loss or disadvantage of another is more contrary to nature than death, than poverty, than pain, than all the misfortunes that can affect him. And that, of course, seems to also fly in the face of the findings of the Milgram experiment, which were done in a particular context. And remember, what has emerged out of the Milgram experiment is a notion that we are inherently disposed to be cruel. So this experiment, these experiments I've got to describe is, is, is a more rigorous, I would suggest, test of these. So to do these experiments, we took a classic economic game. And the economic game is very, very simple, like a lot of economic games. It's called the dictator game. And all it means is that player one is given a lump of money, and he's got a choice. 
He can keep the lot of it and give nothing to the second player. Or he can give some of the money. And that's all there is really to it. There is no advantage or no disadvantage that will accrue from him doing one or the other. Now, in economics, what will generally happen is that player one will always give a certain amount of money, which is reassuring. And there are very complicated reasons why that might be, one being reputation in relation to the other subject. So I'm just going to take you through how we did these experiments because it's very, very important. Because reputation and meeting the other person outside afterwards could have very powerful impact upon how you behave. And we had to exclude that. So what you have is a decider, the dictator. This is the receiver. Two subjects came to the lab, and they were randomly, truly randomly assigned to this role. We ensured that the other person knew that there was a real other person there by the following scenario. They came down along a corridor, one of them. The other one was in a room. They all had to wear these yellow gloves. It's almost like somebody treating a serious infectious disease. We wanted to disguise every possible thing about them other than it was a person. Their gender, their color, race, etc. And the experimenter is here. And they dip into a bowl are into a box, and they draw to get, you see them dipping into, um, to get the balls that will tell them that they are a decider or a receiver. So that is the way the experiment goes. So one of them will be the decider, one of them will be the receiver. So that's the setup for the two experiments I'm going to describe. And in the first one, and these are different experiments with different subjects, what happens is the decider is the only person, by the way, who will get money in this experiment, sees that they have a, or get pain, they're given an allocation of pain. And it's by a spin, so there's 24 possible shocks they will get. So there's a spinning wheel, and it, this tells them that you're going to get 18 shocks, the other person, the receiver, is going to get six. Okay? So that's the setup. But there's a little twist to it. There's three different frames to this experiment. In the give frame, I can give, I, let's suppose an, I'm the dictator. I can, in addition to what randomness gave me, I can decide to give you six more. In the take frame, I can decide you've got X number of shocks, you've got 18 and I've only got six. I can take six and take them on board and suffer them for you. Or in another frame, it's called the give or take frame, you can decide to give or to take. So is that clear? So I'm the subject, there's a roulette which will determine how much pain out of 24 possible shocks I'm allocated. In the give, I can give some over to you. In the take, I can see what you're getting and I can take some back from you. Because it's always apportioned between the two of us. So it could be out of 24, it could be 18, 6, 12, 12, 6, 18. So this is the give frame. So you see that. You can leave and change, or I can give six shocks to the other person. This is the take. I can leave and uh, changed, or I can take six shocks. And this one, I have both choices. So that's the complicated allocation of pain. So the question here is, will people allocate, will they show fairness in their behavior. And we do this for both money and for pain. So we just don't do uh, sadistic experiments. We also do it for money. And this is to provide a comparison. And what we show just here is that on average, across all the frames, people seem to go for the happy medium. There seems to be an equal allocation of pain, a slightly selfish motivation in terms of money, but nothing is significantly different. So on, that's across all the frames. So what I'm going to show you now is across the take and give frames. And this is the default offer. So this is the probability of me changing the offer and taking pain from the other person. So as the other person gets more and more pain, the probability, that's the probability of me taking pain when they get getting 1824 is much, much increased.
and the probability of me giving shocks to the other person when they're getting none is also increased. So there's an equality behavior here, even if this means that I am going to suffer. People have a strong disposition towards fairness. And we're repeating the experiment here with money, and this is basically showing exactly the same pattern of money. When I'm getting a lot of money, you're getting none, I am disposed to distribute some to you. When the other person has a lot of money, I'm disposed, more disposed to take money from you. So this is showing a very powerful sense of fairness, but perhaps not as powerful as in the last experiment, where now we pit both pain and money within the same experiment. So subjects come into the dictator has got money and they can make money. They're the only person that can make money. So here's how the, the experiment goes. They see this, shock for you. You can get seven shocks and you will get 10 euro. But there's an alternative you can go for. You can e even decide to go for 10 shocks and you'll get 15 euro, okay? So that's shocks for me, for me. But in some of the rounds, I will see that you are going to get seven shocks for 10 euro. I collect the money, by the way, in these experiments. You never collect the money. So I could say, mm, yeah, or I have the alternative of 10 shocks uh, for you and 15 euros. That's for me. So in any of these experiments, I could decide, I don't care about you. I'm just going to shock you and collect the money. Uh, and so that's how the experiment goes. And this is just the very basic results. This is the paper that's come out today. So the probability of making a harmful choice, in other words, giving you more shocks under two scenarios, I, you don't need to go into those details, is much, I'm much less likely to give you shocks than give me shocks myself. And equally, the mean, the average number of shocks that you get or I get, it should be roughly equivalent if you're a fair, is actually less for you. And what we do in this study is, and I don't want to go into the technical details, is we can work out with a very simple mathematical model the value of pain to me and to you. And we call this parameter, it's called K. And we can map the distribution of that harm parameter, that harm aversion parameter. And what this shows is that my harm aversion for harm to you is much greater across two experiments than the harm aversion I have for myself. And to put it more simply, if people were just equitable, this line you would, would be absolutely level. So what I'm seeing here is that these are all the subjects, each of these bars, that most of the subjects value other people's state above their own state. There's a few that doesn't, well, and they're very interesting. But in two experiments, I'm placing more value on your state than on my own, indicating that subjects in this experiment are not only altruistic, but they're hyper-altruistic. They're willing to suffer pain, um, forego money, in order to lessen the pain to you. So to finish, so the three challenges to inaction. I went through conformity. Conformity is a powerful influence because it can dispose us to do things like sort of clap loudly at a great leader who we know is an absolute tyrant, copy the crowd. So you might think that the most dignified thing to do in that thing is just not clap, um, but conformity is a powerful barrier to it. Framing the valence of outcomes, whether the outcomes of our actions or our inaction is good or bad, is a powerful challenge to both action and inaction. And fairness and inequality, the two last experiments that I've showed you, I hope, go against the entire grain of the Milgram that we are sort of carrying just a, um, the, a, a veneer of, uh, of civilization. In fact, we have a deep fairness motivation, which renders it very difficult sometimes for behavior that is inaction. I'm sure that it is one of the motivations why people stumble into wars. It starts off as a fairness motivation.
uh, but of course has consequences uh, that we don't foresee. So this is just to thank uh, UCL, the Wellcome Trust, uh, Max Planck Society, and of course the Einstein Foundation, and these are some of the people whose experiments I've described. Thank you very much. Thank you.